How's everybody doing? Good. I'm good. Good. I was born and awake, ready to go, ready to learn. I hope that you picked up uh, one of the lessons that's out on the uh, pulpit as you walk in the front door. If you did not, now might be a good chance to grab one. There's also bulletins. Brother Joe's got some of those. There's probably some out there as well. And so uh, if you didn't get a lesson, uh, you can pick one up at the, the, the right when you come in the front door. There's a stack of them. And uh, I get it. for now, brother, what song are we going to Number 381. 381 in your house. Again, we just thank thee, dear Lord, and praise thee for all the blessings that thou hast bestowed upon us, dear Lord. We just ask you, dear Lord, that we just keep trusting you, dear Lord. And too, dear Lord, we just ask you to be with the pastor this morning as he brings a message. Give you all praise and all thanks. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. To remind you, these lessons really, uh, these uh, lesson handouts are, are almost identical to what we're going to teach in the mornings. That is on purpose, not so that you can just ignore me and read ahead, but so that you can take them home and have all the information that we went over in class uh, to refer back to. Because if you're anything like me, you'll think I should remember that or I should keep that in mind, and then tomorrow you forget it. Uh, so this, that's why we're handing these out right now. You can let me know. Uh, whether or not it works for you uh, at the end of this lesson series. We've got uh, seven weeks to go after this one, this 10-week series. We're looking at Psalm 101, uh, Christianity 101, kind of a basic introduction to Christian living, uh, things we can learn from this uh, 101st Psalm. 
And so we're going to pray, and then we're going to jump right into our third lesson, which is verse number 2 of Psalm 101. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you so much for your word and the ability to study it uh, together and uh, free from persecution and fear. Lord, we thank you for all who are able to be here, both physically and uh, through the internet and live stream. Lord, we thank you for all you do for us. Please help us to be attentive to your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Psalm 101, go ahead and turn there with me in your Bibles. We're going to start, as we have started our other lessons here, by just reading Psalm 101. One of the, one of the reoccurring assignments of the, of the lessons is to memorize the verses of Psalm 101. And so we read it every class. It'll kind of help us along that way. The Bible says, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. We talked about that last week. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within mine house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. A bunch of, a bunch of I wills and I won'ts that King David makes uh, concerning his personal walk with the Lord, things that he's going to do and not do. And, and it's good for us to uh, consider these things Ourselves. This verse 2, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Essentially, it's three parts to that verse, three lessons in one, and we're going to try and get through all of it this morning. Uh, first, we have wise behavior. Second, we have a desire for God's presence. And third, we have private holiness. Uh, we're going to just tackle these one at a time this morning, and that way if we don't quite get through them all, we'll have a good stopping point. So first thing, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. The assignment last week was to, to make a list of things that you did in your life that were wise and things that you did in your life that were unwise. And uh, that may have been an entertaining list for some of you, um, but, uh, but it is, at this point in our lives, we know what, we have an idea, we should have an idea of what wise behavior is. Sometimes we can forget what wise behavior is in, in a certain situation or circumstance or when we get caught up in the moment. Uh, but we ought to know, sitting in church on a Sunday morning, uh, what wise behavior is. So wise behavior encompasses many things, of course, but uh, put simply for the Christian, wise behavior is behavior that is directed by and influenced by the Word of God. You're in Psalm 101. Turn with me to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible as far as words go. It is also one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Psalm 119 and verse number 9, the Bible says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And then go all the way with me to verse 105, another one that you probably know by heart. Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. One more, turn to Psalm 119 and verse 133. Verse 133, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any uh, iniquity have dominion over me. Wise behavior is behavior that walks according to the Word of God. If you, if you are patterning your life after the Word of God, you will automatically be behaving wisely because the Bible is a book full of wisdom and that teaches wisdom. But it's important to understand that it's not that the wisdom of men and the wisdom of God are two different things. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. You must consider that there are those who are wise in things of this world, and there's nothing wrong with having wisdom like that. That helps surely when you're seeking a job and ways to provide for your family and things like that. But we ought to also have some heavenly wisdom about us. First Corinthians 1 and verse number 20, the Bible says, Where is the wise? 
Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both the Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Of God, I think it's interesting that, that it ends with you know, labeling Christ as being the power of God in our lives and the wisdom of God in our lives. Those Jews required a sign, the Greeks sought after wisdom. There are definitely people like that in our world today. They, they miss the wisdom of God, they miss Christ because they're too busy uh, seeking proof and seeking evidence and following after signs and wonders and all these things, and they miss all the wisdom that God has to offer in His Word. And through his son, or they are the, the type, uh, not necessarily the prove it to me type, but the ones that seek after the wisdom of the world. I believe in science. Well, good, because science proves the Bible. Uh, true science proves the Bible. All, all science that is provable uh, goes along with the Bible. Everything else is theory. And so it's, it's, there's people that seek after wisdom and fall short. There's people that seek after science and fall short, but we ought to seek after the wisdom of God. Psalm 18, verse 30 and 31 state, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? Consider also Psalm 19, 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. It's, it's very simple. If we, if we want to behave wisely in a perfect way, we must rely on the wisdom that comes only from the word of God. As wise as our peers may seem to be, they're still human. And as wise as your pastor may seem to be, or seem not to be, uh, still human. And so our final authority for all wisdom in our life ought to come from this Bible. Amen. Uh, ought to always come from the Bible. Um, turn to James chapter number 1. You probably know where we're going here, but that's alright. Somebody watching from home might not know where, what this verse is. James chapter number 1. And we're going to read a couple of verses, or a few verses actually, we're starting in verse number 5. The Bible says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Wisdom is something that People strive so hard to gain, and people go to school for so long, and, and none of that's necessarily wrong on its own, but if you never ask for wisdom from God, you're not going to get wisdom from God. It's, it's very simple. You, have, you just have to ask. Ask the Lord, believe that he'll give it to you, and open his word and receive it. Uh, but uh, there are so many people who say, I want to know more about the Bible. I want to know more about God. But that's all they do. They say it. But they don't ask God for it, and even if they ask God for it, they don't show that they believe he'll give it to them by actually opening up the source of all the wisdom. Uh, God's not going to just transplant into your mind wisdom. You have to actually read the Bible and pray and seek after wisdom. Uh, Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. As Christians, we're not, uh, we don't have a past to just be as, as wise or as unwise as we are currently. We are supposed to walk in wisdom, not just within the body of Christ, but towards them that are without. We ought to walk and behave ourselves in a wise way because that has an effect on the world around us. People see you acting like a fool, and they are not going to really put much credence to what you have to say about God, about heaven, and about hell, and about judgment, and about Jesus Christ and salvation, uh, because they think you're a fool. Uh, that, this, is, this is one of the reasons that I tell Christians to major on the major and minor on the minors, because some people get so caught up in some odd theory or some odd belief that has nothing to do with salvation, and that's the first thing they talk to anybody about. And people hear that and they think, well, you're, 
you're not that smart. <laughs> and then they lost all chance of witnessing to that person. I, I, know, I know a couple of flat earthers, and, and one of them, it's just, that's the first thing he tells you, is that he's a flat earther, and you're, you're a fool for not being a flat earther. And, and hey, good for him, but he's also a Christian. I'm telling him, you, know, you tell somebody, you start the conversation with, I believe in a flat earth, and you should too. You can't witness to him about Jesus Christ anymore unless they're one of the one-tenth of, one-hundredth of one percent of people that agree with you on it's the same with when we talk about politics. You lead the conversation with politics, and you've lost all chance of witnessing to that person unless they agree with you on politics. Why not lead with Christ and then worry about all the other stuff? Uh, that, that'd be wise. <laughs> it'd be wise to make the most important thing come out first. Christian has no excuse for a lack of wisdom as we have access to the wisdom of the Creator, the heavens, and the earth through prayer and through the scriptures. The issue is often a lack of desire for the wisdom to discern how we should behave each day. We often seek after the world's wisdom, but to behave ourselves wisely in a perfect way, we need the wisdom of the Lord. All right, second, second part of that verse. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? This is interesting because King David, he's writing a psalm full of statements regarding his own intentions on how he's going to live for God. I will, I will, I will, I won't. I will not, uh, etc. That's what the entire psalm essentially is. But right here, towards the beginning, we have this statement thrown in there, Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? It just kind of shows that there's such a desire in David's heart to have the presence of God in his life that he can't even get through a list of telling God some things without asking God, Hey, when are you going to be with me again? When are you going to come unto me? And, and so it's, there, there's a clear desire in David's heart to have the presence of God in his life. Psalm 63, verses 1 and 2, uh, they're in your lesson there. It says, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsted for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen in uh, seen thee in, thy, in the sanctuary. David makes very clear he has a burning desire for the presence of God. And he has that desire. You see that at the end there, it says, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. That's kind of an important part, because if he never goes to the sanctuary, he doesn't have any reference of seeing power and glory from God. King David was there. He was at the church house, and he saw God move at the church house, and so he had something to look back on and say, I want that again. Now, many of us here, I say us, many of you here are, are a little bit older than I am, and, and you've got some years behind you in church. And maybe you've had church services where the preacher never even got to preach, and the altars were filled, and people were weeping and crying and praising the Lord, and just, just the Holy Spirit was there, and it was happening. And, and may, I mean, sure, you've been in a lot of services that weren't like that, but those services like that, you get to thinking about the presence of God just falling on a place and on a people, and you just you just beg God, I want that back. I want to go back to that. I want to have that again. It's good to be able to look back and say, I know God was there. I know God was present and he was working, and I really want that again. Uh, David had that desire to have... God's power in his life. We as Christians, we know the power of God uh, because of the Word of God. We even have the Spirit of God living within us, yet so often we have no desire for the presence of God in our lives. Not just at church, but on the job and at the dinner table and driving down the road, we ought to desire to meet with the Lord. On Sunday morning, we all hope to meet with the Lord. I, I hope you hope that. Maybe some people just hope to get through without falling asleep so they can go home and eat mac and cheese. But hopefully, at least on church day, we desire to meet with God. But it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be restricted to just when we meet together with other Christians. It should be every day of our lives, morning to evening, we should have a desire for God to meet with us. Amen. A desire to, to pray and actually feel the presence of God. A desire to sing praises and actually feel the presence of God. Have any of you, now, this, I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it. Have any of you continued to do that, and to the best of your ability, I know it's hard, but a, a, a hymn every morning and every evening? Anybody done that? No? Well, 
Chorus of the day. Miss Jen. There, what? Chorus of the day. Chorus of the day. There's something. That, that first assignment we had was, was a hymn every morning and every evening, a different one. And boy, it, it changes the way your day goes when you start off singing about the Savior. And uh, so many people, myself included for many years, they're Christians, they're saved, they go to church, they're faithful, maybe they even participate in many things, but their personal, private life of prayer, Bible study, and especially praise just doesn't really have much power to it. We, but part of that is because we really just don't desire to meet with God when we're busy at work. We don't desire to meet with God when we have other things on our mind. We ought to have that desire to meet with God all the time. And if work gets in the way, well, sorry, sorry, work, I'm meeting with the Lord. <laughs> and uh, I've had times working secular jobs where there have been people that have come to me and asked me to pray with them on the job while we're clocked in. And it's just, sure, yeah, why not? And it's just, you, know, you never, we, we can't turn off our Christianity when we clock into work. And we can't turn off our Christianity when we're mowing the yard. And we can't turn off our Christianity when we're going out to dinner with the wife. We ought to always have a desire for the presence of God. It shouldn't take 90% of a morning service to get us in the right atmosphere of worship and the right atmosphere of longing for God to where by the altar call we finally want God to speak to us. But that's often how it goes. Because so often so many Christians, they, they only sing at church and they only take time to pray at church and they only get Bible when they're get being fed it at church. I don't think that applies to many people here, but it applies to a lot of people who call themselves Christians. We ought to have a desire to meet with the Lord. Not every saved, blood-bought, born-again Christian has the Holy Spirit of God living within them. We know this. John 14 verses 16 through 17 tell us this. It says, I will, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. Very clear teaching from the Word of God. When you're saved, when you're truly saved by the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. So I understand the idea that we always have the presence of God to that extent, to that degree. But that doesn't mean that we're always experiencing the presence of God in our lives. Why is that? Well, Ephesians 4.30. I know it's in your notes here, but go ahead and turn with me in your Bible to Ephesians 4.30. Those watching at home are probably having a hard time keeping up because they don't have everything printed in front of them like you guys do. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30. The Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption, with all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We, we are told, don't grieve that Holy Spirit that lives within you. Just because God lives within you doesn't mean that you always feel the presence of God. Why? Because, well, when, you, when God tries to move on your heart and tell you to do something, and you say, no... You are pushing him down and pushing him down and pushing him down. When, when, you, are, uh, when you willfully sin against God, you're, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. You're, you're just beating up the Holy Spirit in your heart and pushing him into this corner in your life and shutting the door on the closet that he's in until Sunday morning when, when we let him out of the closet and say, Okay, you, you, can, you can come out now. There's a lot, of, a lot of people that say that they're Christian and there's no evidence at all in their life that the Holy Spirit dwells within them except maybe on Sunday morning. And it's sad because if we'll just let the Holy Spirit have control of our lives and we'll just do what the Holy Spirit leads us to do and, and witness when the Holy Spirit leads us to witness and, and obey the Word of God and we'll just live for the Lord like we should, then we won't restrict His power in our lives. That's why people that have the Holy Spirit can come to church week after week and get nothing out of the service and, and, and get nothing out of the singing and nothing out of the preaching. And then just one week, it just all clicks and, and it's just like, like a whole new thing. Like, did we get a new pastor? Like, what happened? It just, all of a sudden, it's different. I think a lot of the times it's because throughout the week, we sin. We neglect 
the Word of God, we neglect our prayer life, we neglect the Holy Spirit within us, and come Sunday, it's like we're trying to revive an almost dead thing inside ourselves. And the Sunday service gets it back to life, but doesn't really give it the power uh, that it should have in our lives. I hope this is making sense to you. Um, his convicting, when we numb ourselves to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit by rejecting His guidance, and eventually, uh, though He is there, though He is in us, we have effectively locked Him away so there's no bearing on our hearts anymore. We've seared ourselves, we've numbed ourselves to God, and uh, though He's there, it really doesn't affect us anymore. That's not a good place to be. When we desire God's presence in our lives, though, we will begin to repent of those things that get between us and the Lord, and uh, pray and ask God to work in us again. We begin to study the Bible and beg God exactly what David begged God in Psalm 119, 18. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Not just let me read my chapter for the day, but Lord, please show me something wonderful. Show me something amazing in your word today. It doesn't take long reading the Bible to find something incredible. Uh, find something amazing if you know what to look for, if you're looking for it. Uh, I've heard it said that you can find Christ on every page, and you know, I, I don't know. I haven't gone through and checked every page, but I, I know there's a lot of places that you can find teaching and preaching and shadows of Jesus Christ that people don't have any idea to look at. There's, there's times that I've preached messages and people said, I've never seen that before. I, you know, I've, I've read that a hundred times, and I've never seen it before. And it just, the Lord just shows us things. Uh, myself and you as well in your personal devotions, God will show you things if you desire to see Him. If you ask God to show you something from His Word, He's not going to say, well, no, I don't want you to know that. Uh, he's going to give you that wisdom if you seek it. If you seek it in faith, trusting and believing. Jeremiah 33 3. Jeremiah 33 3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things. Yeah, yeah, call to me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. It's a very good, very good verse on point with that. James, uh, James 4, 7 and 8 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So often we, we look at a verse like this and we say, okay, uh, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to me. And we ask God to draw nigh to us, but we never draw nigh to him. And if we want the presence of God in our lives, we've got to draw nigh to God. We've got to put some effort in on our part to, to clean our act up if that's what's necessary, to, to pray and dedicate more of our time and energy to, to prayer or to study. Whatever it may be, we need to put some effort into our walk with God. It can't be a one-sided relationship. It's often been said, you know, if, if you talk to God as much as you talk to your spouse, how would your marriage be? Or if you, talk, if you talk to your spouse as much as you talk to God, how would your marriage go? And uh, I don't know, some people might go better. I don't know. But, uh, but it's, a, it's a sobering thought. We have, we're supposed to have a relationship with God. But how often are we communicating with Him? All right, that's enough of that. We, we ought to ask ourselves often, do I truly desire the presence of God in my life? So much so that I'm willing to remove any obstacle of sin so that I may draw an eye to Him and He to me. Third part of that Psalm 101, verse number 3, is I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Now, often when you see the word perfect in the Bible, it, it, it doesn't really mean exactly what our dictionary says it means today. It's, it's not that the Bible's wrong. The Bible's not wrong. It's just that we don't have a proper understanding of English sometimes. Uh, but the word perfect often means, uh, I guess you could say, in, in our vernacular, striving towards perfection or always being perfected, um, but it's not out of reach to to have a, a perfect heart in, in the biblical sense. I walk within my house with a perfect heart. There are a few ways you could look at this. You could look at it as he's going to lead his home in a way that is right according to God, and there's definitely a message there and a lesson there. Um, but I think. It's more in line with the context that he is going to behave himself wisely in a perfect way, but also when he's alone, when he's in his own house, when it's just him and the Lord, he's still going to walk 
with a perfect heart. He's not going to be one who behaves wisely in public and behaves wisely at church, but when he gets home, he lives like the devil. Uh, he's, he's not going to be that person. It's one thing to behave ourselves wisely in a perfect way when others can see us. It's another thing entirely to have private holiness in our lives. So often we see people who play the part of Christians so well on Sunday that when the big reveal comes and everybody finds out that he or she ran out on their spouse or was addicted to drugs or was a terrible child to their parents, people always just don't believe it. How could, how could that family be so messed up? They were, they were always in church and they were always happy. They were always singing and they, were, they taught Sunday school and they did that. Am I the only one that's ever experienced that? It's, it's just, you, you see these people that you think those are awesome Christians and then you find out later on they were hanging on by a thread and that thread broke. It's, it's sad. You can't last long faking your way through your Christian life. All things will be revealed. And even if, even if the whole world doesn't find out about what's going on in your private life, the Lord knows. And the Lord is not going to bless the efforts of a person who claims his name and then turns around and lives like the child of the devil. God's not going to bless that. And so it'll be evident in your life if, if you're not walking with a perfect heart. We may not be able to always see it right now. But the Lord sees it, and often those things do come out. They do great damage. Great damage, not just to your own testimony, but to the testimony of the Lord. It's sad that we have so many examples we can look at of, of nationally known preachers and ministers and evangelists and missionaries. People that people whose names you would know that if you say the name, you're like, oh yeah, that person ran off with a secretary to Hawaii. Now, that person, uh, that person went and did inappropriate things with a girl in the youth group, etc., etc., etc. There's no memory of the thousands of people they led to the Lord. There's no memory of the churches that they built. It's just, oh, look at look at the terrible thing they were hiding. So it's pretty important that we walk within our house, that we walk privately with a perfect heart. There are things that you do, things you, that you dwell on in your mind, things that you desire in your heart that none of your brothers or sisters in Christ know about. David here states that he's not just going to behave wisely, uh, he is going to walk within his house, out of the public view, with a perfect heart. It's one of the most difficult commitments found in Psalm 101, in my opinion, because it's often so easy in today's world to hide sin here. Especially for young people today, to hide sin from their parents is very easy, especially with the internet, because they they know more about their parents, most likely, than about how to use that stuff and how to track things and how to delete search histories and, and all that stuff. It's very easy, very easy for people to hide sin, at least for a little while, in today's day and age. So many people don't even try, but it's even easier to hide it in your heart. Keep in mind that you can sin in your heart without ever any, anyone ever finding out. Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 5, 27 and 28. Christ here says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. There's a sin that you can commit in your heart and not do anything, not say anything. Your face might give it away, your, your, your long look might give it away, but most people aren't going to notice that. John three, uh, 1 John 3.15 says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. There, there's a lot of churches that have a lot of people that I sit on this side and you sit on that side because I don't like you. <laughs> Hi, brother. How you doing? Been praying for you. Get in the car. I hate you. I'm thankful that as far as I know, that's not how it is here. As far as I know, there are some churches that you just wonder. You know, the, the church gets over and five minutes after the service ends, nobody's in the building. And you just wonder, is there any love of the brethren in there or is there not? I'm thankful for a church where it's, it's not just book it for the door as soon as you can. There's, there's some love here. There's some relationships here. It's a family. Families do squabble, I'm sure, but... Uh, but there's, there's sins that you can commit that nobody really can see. So, 
when our hearts tend to run off whatever, to whatever way they desire, and the fleshly old man within us has a pretty tight hold on our hearts, what do we do? Well, Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? Well, it answered, he answers his own question. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the ratings, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Who can know the heart of man? Well, God does. So what do we do? Well, ask God to fix your heart. Psalm 51. Turn to Psalm 51. This is a very famous psalm of David after his affair with Bathsheba. Psalm 51, and we're going to focus on verse number 10. David here asked God, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You want to walk in your house with a perfect heart? Well, even you don't know necessarily which way your heart is going to try and pull you next. It's best to just ask God to take control of that thing. Ask God to clean that thing up and, and create the right spirit within you. Pray to God not just for things or for people or for ministries, but pray for your heart. <laughs> that God will make your heart right. That God will give you a burden to witness for the people, whatever it may be that you need. Uh, that heart is very important in our lives and very deceitful and wicked above all things, the Bible says. So we ought to make sure that we're periodically asking God to just rinse that thing off and wash that thing thoroughly and make sure that there's nothing hiding in that heart that's going to steer us down the wrong road. Colossians 3, 2 and 3 says, Set your affections on things above, not on things in the earth, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. That, that's, that's what we can do. If we, if we desire that perfect walking in our own house with a perfect heart, that personal holiness, we need to set our affections on things above, not on things of the earth. Psalm 57, 7, My heart is fixed. O oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Take that heart that tends to wander. Take that heart that tends to be tempted so easily and just pin it to the ground and say, you're going to stay right here, right where God wants you to be. And, and then every now and then, you just ask the Lord, make sure that thing's clean. Make sure that thing's not filthy again. And it's just, it's just it's like, like the oil in your car. It needs a checkup every now and then, or else it's going to really break the whole thing down. That heart needs to be good rinsing every now and then, a good renewing every now and then, and only God can do that. So we, we need to, if we're going to walk in our houses with a perfect heart, we have a, a holy private life as well as a holy public life, we're going to need the Lord to take the reins of that heart of ours. Well, today we have three questions to answer with these three statements. Will I seek to behave wisely in a perfect way? I would hope everybody would say, I desire to behave wisely. Uh, I mean, I know there's times in my life where that was the opposite of, of my desire, but mostly in a, in a fun-loving way, you know, like it's not wise to, to jump off of this super high tower that my... There's some unwise things I've done in my days. My, my dad and I, we had a 4th of July picnic at, for, for the church at my parents' house, and we had a pond that was 10 feet deep, and so, of course, we constructed using old telephone, or not old telephone poles, old uh, uh, antenna housings for, for houses. We ripped two of them off of rentals. We stuck them at the end of the dock, and lashed them together, and made a 15-foot high hillbilly high dive. And, of course, diving from 15-foot into a 10-foot pond full of muck is not the smartest thing to do. So I have not always behaved wisely. But for your information, my mother-in-law, Rose, Michelle's mom, also jumped off that thing. So I'm not the only unwise person. Uh, but uh, there's a difference between you know unwise behavior in that sense and unwise behavior in the spiritual sense. As goofy as some of us may be and as odd of decisions as some of us may make, we ought to be very careful spiritually to behave wisely. We ought to be very careful around others to behave wisely so that we can witness to them and they just don't think we're just some kind of crackpot. Maybe you are. But if you are, at least try to hide it. <laughs> at, least, at least don't lead with, with the craziness. Lead with the Lord. Do I honestly desire to have the presence of God in my life every single day? Not just, you know, not just, well, Lord, when I want to, you can be there. 
but all the time, every day, morning to evening. Such a presence of God in your life that he can just tell you, witness to that person, and you go and you witness that person. Pray about that thing, and you go and you pray about that thing. Open up your Bible, and you go and open up your Bible. You, you follow the leading of the Lord in your life, and you'll see great and mighty things happen in your life because of that. So often people say, I, I just don't see God working in my life. It's like, yeah, you won't let him. Except on Sunday. You want him to work on Sunday, but you can't. Monday through Saturday, there's nothing. We can't push God into a corner in our, in our hearts and our minds and then expect Him to come running back out when we, when we open the door. We need to live in a way that invites the presence of God in our life. And then also the last question is, will I strive to be holy and private and have a perfect heart before God? Or will I say, well, I'm better than that person, I'm good enough, not many people would verbalize that. Not many people would actually say, well, I'm, I'm, I feel like I live good enough. Uh, a lot of people say that when you go door knocking, when you hand out tracts on the street, they say, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. But most Christians in church wouldn't say, I'm good enough. <laughs> most would say, you know, Lord's, Lord's still working on me, but do we really want that? Do we want that perfect private life? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the lessons we can learn through these verses in Psalm 101, I pray please help me to apply them to my life. Lord, help us to be better for it. Lord, it, it would be a worthless effort if we study through all of this, all of this chapter in your word, all of this psalm, and, and don't apply any of it to us, Lord. Lord, knowledge and wisdom are two different things. Lord, if we, we may know much about the Bible, but until we apply the knowledge to our lives and to our hearts, it doesn't become wisdom. Lord, I pray please help us to seek after wisdom, help us to seek after personal holiness, Lord, help us to long for and desire for your presence. We love you and pray that you please have your will and way in the following service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Real quick, before you dismiss, the, the assignment this week is to memorize Psalm 101, verses 1 through 3. Hopefully you've already done verses 1 and 2, uh, but we're, we're going to verse 3 this week. Continue if, you, if you're able to sing a different hymn if you're choosing every morning and every evening this week just because it's a good thing to do. And then the, uh, the actual new assignment is make a list of things you feel fall under the definition of wicked things and works of them that turn aside. That's from the next verse we'll look at. As well as a few ways in which you can be sure they will not cleave to you. Uh, that's the next verse. That's Psalm 101 verse 3. That's what we're going to look at next week. So make that list of wicked things, things that you think are wicked things and works of those that turn aside, and then some solutions to not let those things cleave to you. That's the assignment, and you are dismissed. Thank you for your good attention.